on um, track one had the wonderful Jimmy Pollard with us. And on track two, if you wanted to attend that, we have Dr. Michael Hayden uh, presenting Priolenia's research update. But I'll just hand over and welcome um, Jimmy Pollard, if you want to turn your camera and microphone on. Hi. Let's take it away. Perfect. So Huntington's Disguise is the title of this. And I suspect that you already know what Huntington's Disguise is. Because let's say you have a photograph of your family, maybe a group photo at a holiday event. And you look at maybe Uncle Joe and you say, see, he was just starting to get affected or walk his HD road just by the appearance of the photo, or maybe individual photos of, of your parents or grandparents too, but you recognize it for what it is. That's Huntington's disguise. I also look at it this way. You recognize the uh, masks of comedy and tragedy from the ancient Greek theater that have come to represent um, the whole breadth and uh, depth of human emotion, happy, glad, angry, sad, everything. One more of the challenges of HD is that it places another mask on it. And this is it. This is Huntington's disease. This is Huntington's disguise. It's created by a combination of some of the uh, physical and movement features uh, of HD and some of the cognitive challenges um, of HD. They go together and in effect create a mask or a disguise. And I want to, in the next half hour, um, break them down and look at their elements to help you recognize it, to see through it and see how your loved one may actually be feeling um, beyond that disguise so that you won't be fooled or misled by it. And also, and most importantly, so that you can teach it to others. So um, first I wanna mention three movement related uh, features of HD from that physical movement domain. They are motor impersistence, dystonia, and balance. So first, motor impersistence. Let me briefly explain what motor impersistence is. As I'm speaking to you and holding this can, doing two things at once, my brain is doing the work. I don't have to consciously think about holding the can. The muscles in my fingers and thumb and all that's involved in it, the contractions in those muscles are said to persist. If they don't persist, I drop the key. So motor persistence is difficulty maintaining contractions. It's often taught, even in medical school, as milkmaid's grasp, like milk in a cow. So the, the notion is grab the udder, pull, release. Grab the udder, pull, release. Grab the, you don't maintain the contraction on the cow's udders when you're milking a cow. So it's a great mnemonic device, milkmaid's grasp. But you may recognize it as family with this scenario. Let's say, especially if you're a kid, a child, uh, you may recall driving with your mom or dad down a long stretch of highway or motor, motorway, and they're driving. And as they are driving, they're maintaining their foot on the gas pedal or the accelerator. And if they have early signs of motor impersistence, maybe over time, not dramatically, not like that, maybe over time, their foot, that contraction doesn't maintain and they realize, oh, I'm slowing down and they bring it back up to speed. And then again, over time, it comes back up they realize it again, and they bring it back up to speed. Now, if you're, again, especially a child, but maybe anybody, maybe you recall 
driving with them, the experience of driving with them was kind of felt kind of like, whoa, whoa, as that went back and forth. So that, that's one perhaps manifestation of motor persistence that a lot of HD families will recognize. What does motor persistence contribute, have to do with the disguise? Most importantly, it has to do with smiling. So that when we're speaking to one another or when we see one another, we may smile. All these contractions here and that contribute in the muscles to my smile. But if I have motor persistence, I can't maintain those contractions, you get back to this. A neutral face, flat. And one more point about facial stuff. When we speak to one another, we use nice, crisp, direct eye contact. But there's something more. And it is, when, especially when we begin to engage in conversations, there's like a brightening in these mini muscles in the eyelids or in the forehead around here. It's hard to show on the screen. If we were in person, it would be easy. But when you engage with somebody, there's kind of a brightening of those that signal more than just eye contact, but okay, now we're engaged in a conversation. So motor and persistence's contribution to the disguise is that brightening, even if you greet somebody like eyes and smile and you have difficulty maintaining it, it goes back to flat. Think of the picture that you saw of Uncle Joe. The second phys uh, physical or movement related feature I wanna address is this notion of dystonia or a disorder of muscle tone. So a, a dis, order dis of tone, dystonia. And this notion, it's a tension in your muscles. Your brain does the work for you um, to keep a certain tension in your muscles so that you can, you can move and uh, sit up straight, erect. Uh, it's often taught with an elastic that there's a certain amount of tension you want in an elastic uh, so that too much is hypertonic and too little is too little tone is hypotonic, floppy. Either one gives you a lot of utility. Dystonia is really where people have sustained contractions that they can, you hear the term, get stuck in. Most notably, dystonia contributes to changes in HD to changes in posture. So let's say maybe you are tight on, the, on in your trunk, tight on this side, loose on this side, and you're leaning to one side. Could be the other, no typical posture. Maybe your head's down, maybe your head's to the side. Maybe your trunk is twisted a bit and you're stuck in this posture. Maybe you're slouching down. Again, none. Maybe when you're walking, you're walking on your toes, or some people walk on their heels. Again, no typical thing, but dystonia contributes to postural change. What does this have to do with the disguise? Well, if you encountered me socially or in a shop or whatever, and maybe I'm going to serve you some kind and you're looking at me and you, you encounter me appearing like this, you begin to think, oh, this is a pleasant job and uh, looks fine. Whatever you're sizing up, before we even begin to interact, I could change what you're going to estimate or anticipate in this interaction simply by changing my posture a little bit. It's the difference between seeing this and this. I did not change the expression on my face. Or maybe this. That conveys something else. Here in um, Eastern Massachusetts in the US where I'm speaking to you from, when we encounter somebody like this, we think attitude because it conveys certain things to us, just their posture. 
that's what dystonia, could, among other things, contributes to the disguise. And the third thing I just want to cover from the movement and physical domain is balance. So as you walk in HD road, you walk your HD road, initially your balance gets challenged, it gets very impaired down the road. Um, it contributes obviously, obviously to people falling or being unable to, to walk. Um, if the problems with balance first manifest themselves in one's ability to balance themselves on one foot. Now, where or when in your daily life do you balance yourself on one foot? Some of the thing that usually comes to people's minds is uh, when I put um, on my pants and, uh, or when I put on my shoes. But um, it's also when you sit down. So I know you can't see this well, but I'm gonna do it just to help out. When you sit down, so as I approach my chair here, there's that moment as I sit and I turn to sit in it to get my behind on the seat. There's that moment where I make my turn to sit down and I'm balanced on one foot. It's just that fleeting millisecond or uh, less than a second where I'm balanced on one foot. <clears throat> you could be sitting in a chair, you could be see, see, sitting on a toilet, you could be uh, sitting down on a bed. Uh, what does this contribute to the disguise? It contributes this, back to this. Let's say you see Uncle Joe and uh, you say, hey Joe, let's have a cup of coffee, sit down. And Joe brings to it all of this. And he sits down, like turns, bad balance, and he flops into a chair. Have you ever seen anybody with Huntington's disease flop into a chair or onto a toilet or into bed? <laughs> that flopping, just like the change in postural and posture conveys things. So those are, the, those are three uh, movement, uh, physical related features that contribute to the disguise, modern persistence, dystonia and balance. And if you put them together, just those, you begin to see Uncle Joe's appearance in the family photos emerge. None of these features are dramatic. Huntington's disguise is a combination of many subtle features. And there are more, time doesn't allow me to cover them all, but these are the ones I think that are the easiest to see. For example, just generalized weakness in people maybe gives you more of that. So now there's those three, I wanna mention two from the uh, cognitive, uh, list, the list of cognitive challenges, the, the cognitive uh, problems, and they are, the slower processing of information. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about memory and the notion that recognizing something memory-wise is easier than recalling it. So first, number one, uh, this notion of slower processing of information. Not necessarily slow processing, although as you walk your road, however, progressively slower processing. It takes you a bit, bit longer to organize your thoughts. This often shows up in interactions with people, engagements with people, primarily in conversations. You have delayed responses. When you think of having a conversation with somebody, there's almost a characteristic or typical back and forth rhythm. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. What are you doing? Hey, I got to work today. What are you doing? Hey, not much, just hanging around. Bum, 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 bum. If one person has a processing, has difficulty processing, it contributes to delays or pauses in those conversations. So you never get that nice back and forth. One person uh, has a processing delay. You, uh, you might say to them, hey, how are you doing? 
Good. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. What are you doing today? It doesn't go back and forth as fluidly. And if you're the person without the delay, it is difficulty to wait. That delay, you begin to make assumptions. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it doesn't go back and forth. You have to wait for them to respond. And sometimes you feel like you want to pull the words out of their mouth, uh, even though they're well aware of what's going on and uh, organizing their thoughts, it's just contributes to delays. It feels kind of like sometimes when you're speaking to somebody with a delay, downshifting a car, downshifting a car. Mm, it's a visceral kind of having to wait. I often have explained this notion of setting the ticker back. So if I said to somebody, uh, hey, what's your daughter's name? And they might want to say, hey, what's your daughter's name? If they had a processing delay, what's your daughter's name? Marianne. But if you have somebody in your life like me, what you get is, what's your daughter's name? How many kids you got? How many boys? How old is she? And all the person wanted to do is get to Marianne, and they find that constant pushing the ticker back, the clock me metaphor, irritating and annoying, and sometimes confusing. So we really have to learn to wait and not set the ticker back. But that slower processing is what contributes to those pauses in conversation. Um, be, uh, caused by those delays in processing. Okay, that's just slower processing. Second one from the cognitive features I want to address uh, is about memory, related to memory. Um, and it's this notion that recognizing something is a bit easier, a bit easier than recalling something. Now, Huntington's disease regarding memory, your fund of information is primarily pretty much retained, pretty much retained. It may take you longer to recall things in your processing, it might take you longer to access them, to organize your thoughts, but HD is not a primary memory disease. This is not Alzheimer's disease. Now, given the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, I know that some of the people I'm speaking to right now may have loved ones walking their Alzheimer's road and you lost family members to Alzheimer's disease like myself. I lost my mother-in-law to a long road of HD. Those poor souls lost their entire fund of information as the general public will always think of Alzheimer's disease, it's like, gee, my mother didn't even recognize me anymore, that kind of stuff. I point this out that HD is not Alzheimer's disease because of the widespread worldwide adoption of this awareness slogan that you hear that goes something like, Huntington's disease has been described as like having Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, whatever. Now, they're both progressive neurologic diseases. But Huntington's disease is not Alzheimer's disease. It is not like living with Alzheimer's disease. You retain your memories as if we don't have enough to be concerned about and worry about looking down the road. Still, that recognition is easier than recall. And that fact has implications, it's, it's often, and it's often explained <laughs> um, in how we ask questions. So people talk about um, if you were taking an examination or test or quiz, by the types of questions you might be asked. First is multiple choice questions, and then there are, these are called different things in different parts of the world, open-ended questions. Here in the US, we call them essay questions, word, word problems, whatever. Multiple choice, open-ended questions. 
most people in most cases prefer multiple choice because there's the answer right there. All you have to do is recognize it. Admittedly, this is oversimplified, but the explanation works. All you have to do is recognize the answer. Open-ended questions, you have to think more about them. Organize your thoughts, recall. So we tend not to like essay questions as much because recognition is a bit easier. What does this have to do with the disguise in our daily lives? It has to do with we are, are frequently asking people open-ended questions like, what do you want for lunch today? Or what do you want to do today? Or back to Uncle Joe, hey, Joe, I haven't seen you in a couple of years. What have you been doing? open-ended questions. If you already have processing delays and pauses, open-ended questions contribute even more to that delay just by how we ask the questions. So now let's think back to Uncle Joe and put all the features together. First of all, he appears with a flat face. He sees you. He goes back to flat because he has motor and persistence when he smiles and brightens. He may look like this because of change in posture. And then you say to Joe, Joe, I haven't seen you in a long time, man. How are you? Sit down. Let's have a cup of coffee. And Joe flops into his chair, maybe slouches a bit. And you say, Joe, it's been a long time. What have you been doing for two years? Not much. It's like the mother of all open-ended questions. <clears throat> um, so all of these things are subtle. None are dramatic. They are subtle signs uh, of movement and thinking taken together that create this disguise. So you know your loved one intimately, but even Spouses, children, parents, even you can be fooled by this disguise. It's insidious. Because everybody else you encounter in your life that doesn't have HD, when you see that appearance, it is reasonable for you to say, gee, he doesn't seem interested. I don't know if the guy likes me. Or that they're sad, or that they're mad, or that they, that they don't understand what you're saying to them. In any other interaction with anybody else, that's a reasonable assumption. But Huntington's disease and how those things go together is an exception. That appearance is a combination of signs from those two groups. Inside, they may very well be as happy or as excited to see you as you are them or interested in what's going on or learning more, but this is what you see. And you, in other cases, would make a reasonable assumption, but not for HD. This is just one more thing in the long list of horrible things about HD. But we need to know what contributes to the, the disguise. We need to label it as the disguise. We need to teach it to others. We need to learn from the Parkinson's disease community, where if you Google Parkinson's mask, you'll get a lot of stuff. Check it out. They talk about this mask with Parkinson's disease, not so much in our Huntington's, the Huntington's world that we share. And we need to teach it to young kids because young kids encounter the disguise often with grandparents. You may hear a child who doesn't understand uh, the disguise and sees their Nana like this. And they may say something to mom like, mom, I don't think Nana loves me. But we need to teach our young kids, three to five kids, three years old to five years old kids, that they might have to find Nana's smile. They may have to look closer. Maybe it's hidden. 
maybe she smiles inside, but she smiles differently. And we can teach that to kids. If they throw themselves in Nana's arms to hug her, it might take her a little bit longer to hug them back. They need to be taught things like, uh, uh, you have to wait for the hug because Nana does things late, whatever. These, th whatever the topic within that, but these notions need to be taught to little kids for their benefit and also so that we don't rob people the joys of interacting with their grandchildren who they cherish. So in closing, <laughs> there are things that contribute to um, the disguise, the movement stuff, the cognitive stuff, understanding individual contributors and the way they come together makes it easier for you when you see that appearance to see through it, see beyond the mask, see through the disguise. It's, um, and when, when you learn the elements as I've covered them, it's easy to explain to people and to teach it. I think of it this way. There is the masks again, and there is HD, Huntington's Disguise. But when you see through it, HD cannot rob you, especially if you're the one walking your HD road. It can't rob you. It can't disguise. It can't hide the whole range of human emotions and feelings. To see through the disguise and see people for who they really are, to see through the disguise moment to moment, day to day, to connect with them, to let endearing moments endure, to do it is an act of love, an act of love. So here's how I look at it. Some of the movement physical signs then some of the cognitive features, they go together to create that mask or disguise. And it's up to us to see that for what it is, take out the elements and reveal this. Those moments that you see through them and go beyond the disguise are small acts of love. That's all I have to say. Thank you for logging on. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Jenna, um, and thank you for logging in. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That That's amazing. Thank you so much. There's just been some loads of great um, comments in chat. So um, we'll just give them a minute. We can stay on for a minute if anyone does have any questions. But I just wanted to read you some of the nice feedback that's been said. So as you were going along, a lot of people were saying they really un they really understood your analogies and they were agreeing with you saying yes definitely this is this is how i feel right now this is so useful thank you so much um someone else commented yes this is so true we're living this there is a big heart behind the mask so i think it was really useful for for people to hear that um some more comments thank you dear jimmy listening to you more and more yeah I can never get enough information from you <laughs> so some really really nice feedback in the chat I don't think we have any specific questions for you um I, I appreciate yeah. the feedback uh to for them for people to say yes you're on the track because it's I've done this hundreds of times over the years but I still don't know if I'm hitting the mark so yes. to hit the, hit the mark you somebody's got to say, yeah, you hit the mark. So I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, I'm just counting up. I think about 12 people at least have commented agreeing, uh, saying that they, yeah, well, understood exactly what you were explaining. Um, and we have lots more online currently, but yeah, at least 12 people commented in chat. And another one's just said, yes, you definitely hit the mark, Jimmy. Beautiful. So thank, thank you, you so much. I'm grateful. Great. Keep all game.
So um, we now have a 15 minute break, everybody. Um, and after that, on track one, we have the testing negative perspectives. And on track two, we have a research Q&A. Remember, there are booths in the exhibition hall if you want to speak with somebody during the break. And you can also chat with the community in the lounge. So huge thank you for you all for joining this session. And a huge thank you again to Jimmy. And we will see you all shortly after the break. Bye, everybody.